Well, good morning to everybody. I, well, I promised you to, to give you reference to that book. It's that book. It's, as I mentioned, it's a rather old book. It was published, the, the, the last edition was published in 1983. But I think still it is really a very good book from just physics point of view how medical physics should look like. So if you want to have the physics background for your work, that book is really, is really nice, is profitable for, for you. Today, when I looked for that book, I even found it in PDF in internet. So maybe it's not fair, but anyway, that book is there. Okay, it was very nice overview of imaging systems which can be used for radiotherapy, what Professor Hartmann made. But before I will go to my lecture, you asked me about the modulation transfer function yesterday, which is in some sense the part of my lecture. So I found in my several lectures I have in my computer a part of one lecture, and I just tell you a few words about that, just to understand what is modulation transfer function. But before I will tell you that, please remember that modulation transfer function in learning, in teaching, is to be in time at all lectures. So if you have, if you want to have a good modulation transfer function, please be in time, okay? That's a professor I say to you. Okay, and now please consider such a, an example. We have cobalt unit. This is the source, quite big. It's two centimeter diameter source. And we have here the block. Okay? And we take a picture of that block. What we will see if we draw the profile of that picture, how that profile will look like. It will well, if that will be something like this, why? Because of the diameter of the source. And that's exactly modulation transfer function. If the source, the source which gives you an image would be ideal, then your image would be like this. Okay? But it's not like this, because the source you used for imagination, for making images, is large one. So your modulation transfer function is not as good as you wish to have. That's the first, well, feeling about modulation transfer function. And now, let's imagine that you have periodical object, okay? Well, we can say sinusoidal object. And let's imagine that you build such an object. So you just, using your computer, you calculate thicknesses along the distance. What should be thicknesses to, at, to have attenuation exactly equal to sinusoidal function, okay? So your object can be described by that function. And this is the formula you can use for that. Okay, that's very simple. It's nothing complicated, okay? 
Let's imagine what happens if you look at an image of that object. First of all, please remember that we can describe with that formula, and this is amplitude, and this is average amplitude, and the fun function which modulates your object, okay? And this is what you get on your image. Let's imagine that that's your function. And the function is described again by exactly the same function, but we have dim different amplitude, and there is shift in phase. Let's imagine that there is. There is. Usually there is. Okay? So we have an object and we have a detector. Sorry for Polish language, but I couldn't change that slide because it was an image, so <laughs> it took me a problem to change it. Yeah, okay? So we have, do you see the difference? The amplitude is different, okay? What is object modulation? It's does the ratio between the amplitude and the average signal which is produced by that object. What is modulation of the detector is exactly the same. What is modulation transfer function is the ratio of these two functions. Okay? So modulation transfer function by definition is this. But of course that depends on the frequency. If we come back to our object, that was the object with a given frequency, but you may have different frequencies in your object. For example, the edge has inside very high frequencies. And these frequencies are not transferred because any longer you have the edge. You have more smooth function. So that means that imaging system is not able to transfer very high frequencies of the object. Okay? And just last slide concerns modulation transfer functions. We have periodical object. We can, using Fourier transform, transform it to, into the uh, frequency space so we can describe our object with different amplitudes uh, for a given frequency, okay? And we can look at the object which was taken with an imaging system we can again transform it into frequency space, and for each frequency we have amplitude, we have divide amplitude of the object and image, and that is modulation transfer function. I cannot say more about that. It's, I'm not ready for it, okay? And now I will change my presentation. Uh, my presentation is, mm, I think it's that one, yes, because just to end, I corrected it because I, you know, so many different ideas came to my mind what to say to you. It's, it's always when I'm listening to other lectures, different ideas come to my mind and I, I think I should change a little bit my presentation. Okay, how to use image information, IGRT. That's the second part of my talk. Okay. Well, what is the most important thing if we consider reproducibility? There is a very nice movie. What is the most important thing? And in that film, the most important thing is family. So but we talk about reproducibility, okay? Well, not procedures, not imaging systems, but good preparation a patient for radiotherapy. Please remember that, that that's the most important thing. You, I think that you don't know how the patient feels 
when he or she is prepared for radiotherapy. How difficult it is to be treated. And consequently, it's difficult to cooperate with such people. Do you make thermoplastic masks in your departments? Who do it? Almost everybody, everybody, OK? Have you ever made yourself that mask? Who made it? OK, and that's a very good idea. Because then you can feel what a patient feels when he or she is prepared for radiotherapy. Because your radiation technologies and also you you have cooperated very well with them. You should talk to them before you start preparation of your treatment. Because reproducibility depends only a little of reproducibility immobilization systems. It depends mostly on the behavior of a patient. For example, it's impossible to immobilize patient in the pelvic region. Just impossible. But if patient lays on the table and doesn't move, that means reproducibility. So you should cooperate. You find the, the good position for, for him or for her, which is just reproducible. Just try to lay on the table without having something uh, below your, your knee. Then immediately you will see that it's difficult to lie in that position. So your work, your aim is to find the best position of your patient. Maybe not your, but you should communicate, you should talk to your radiation technology is to, to explain them how it's important. Here you have, uh, there are, these two pictures are from my department, how the work can be done in not proper way. You may see here, this is from simulation, and this is from treatment. You may see the difference in the position of the spinal cord. But that is certainly because the first position was wrong. That patient was, was pushed to keep the, the, let's say, artificial position for him or for her. And of course, during the treatment, he or she uh, changed his position to the more, more comfortable. So again. That's, the, the, well, I think, the, the most important message I want to, to send to you. Please work with your patient to prepare him or her to find the comfortable position and to, to, to explain him or her what will go on, okay? So that's, that's the most important, okay? Now, let's move to the to the, the more strict part of my presentation. Uh, I'm sure that, uh, well, you know what is tumor control probability. It's just probability of control of, of kill all cells in the irradiated region, OK? Tumor control probability can be, in approximate manner, described with this function. This is TCP, what you would receive if homogeneous mean dose would be delivered to, to the target. And this is, you have to subtract from your TCP for D mean. And sigma is just standard deviation of dose distribution in the clinical target volume. Gamma is so called normalized dose gradient. It tells us how much you, TCP is changed by if you change the dose delivered to a patient of 1%, okay? And that function, let's imagine that your patient for fully homogeneous dose distribution, uh, the TCP is 0.5, then if sigma mm, increases, 
TCP decreases depending on the gamma. If gamma is free, then it's, it's blue, fine. If gamma is five, is I don't know the color, the pink. Uh, in general, I have problems with colors. Men usually have some problems with colors. Okay. Well, so if we think about uh, well procedures we can apply for making our treatment more reproducible, we should think about two two terms about the mean sorry about the mean dose. So that's the dose prescribed by the doctor and total uncertainty of radiotherapy procedure in terms of mean dose depends on the uncertainty of preparations. I mean the TPS calculation model, uncertainty of realization and standard deviation is uniformity of dose distribution in the PTV and mostly it's related to reproducibility of treatment plan. So if your treatment is not reproducible, so the patient moved during the radiation, sigma increases. If sigma increases, TCP decreases. But the most important is, of course, mean dose. If you don't deliver the right mean dose, you change your TCP of a large value. Okay? So what that means, that means that if we think about systematic and random error, systematic errors are those errors who are present all the time during the treatment, okay? And random, they change, uh, they, they change from the day to, to day, okay? And of course, systematic error is most, more dangerous because it influences on the mean dose delivered to, to a patient. The random error is less important, is important, but it's less important because it influences on sigma, on homogeneity of dose distribution in the target, unless it's very big random error. Then also the, the, the mean value is, is changed. Okay, so how we verify radiotherapy in space of dose, it comes prescribes dose and deliver dose, for example, with in vivo dosimetry, with different systems. We measure before we start treatment, so on. And in space of location, which is portal control, which is all things we are talking about. Again, we compare. We have reference image and we have actual image. We compare them and we find the the, uh, we find the difference between them and we know what is an error error of, of the treatment. Again, we can use simulator for that, but however, I don't recommend to use simulator. I recommend to use, you to use digitally reconstructed radiographs. However, however, right now simulators disappear from uh, radiotherapy department, but in my opinion, it's a mistake. Why? Because as I mentioned to you, the most important thing is to, to, to prepare the patient properly for your treatment. How you may prepare your patient for the treatment? Of course, you may talk to a patient. But simulator is the perfect tool to prepare a patient for treatment. And in my department, there is a, an ingenious radiation technologies who introduced so-called introductory simulation. For some patients, before patient starts his or her treatment, he or she, okay, I will tell he, okay, it doesn't matter, just to make it short, okay? He comes to the simulator, he's placed several times on the simulator, so uh, radiation technologies uh, place him on the table of the, uh, of the simulator, take an image or images. He go out of, this, of, of the table. He, they just put him again on the table. They take images and then compare these images. 
And if they see that images are very similar, each one of, of these images are very each one to, to each other, okay, then they are sure that the position they found is right for that patient, is reproducible. Of course, I know that not always it's possible because the time is limited, there is no staff to make it, but it's, remember that it's for, at least for some patients, it's a very good procedure to prepare a patient for your treatment, okay? So this is digitally reconstructed image, how we get it. We just calculated the attenuation of, of the radiation across a patient, and in that way we create an image, and that image should be used as a reference one. So, of course, we, 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 you may see the difference in quality between images. This is digitally reconstructed radiograph, and this is simulator image. If you want to have a very good uh, digitally reconstructed radiograph, you should take your CT uh, cross sections every, let's say, two millimeters. Then your, your DRR will be really a very good one. Okay? Bow should be very narrow, you, you know. So two millimeters step and two millimeter reconstruction. Yeah, yeah. But the problem is that if you send so many images to your doctors, they don't like it very much because they have to draw so many contours. So in our hospital, we have a procedure that we make every two millimeters. We reconstruct because that's helical CT, so that depends on how you reconstruct your images. So we reconstruct them to every two millimeters, but we have another set of images every, let's say, three or four millimeters, depending on the location. But please be very careful with that, because it's very easy to make a mistake. Because your DRRs are added to your plan manually. So it's very easy to miss the set of CT data. And we had such a situation. So now there is a discussion in our department. Maybe we should come back to, to the uh, first idea to have exactly the same step and same, uh, well, the, the same set of images uh, should be used for the preparation of digitally reconstructed radiographs and for drawing contours. It's just our problem, not your problem. But, well, I just mentioned about that because I think it's a it's practical issue. Okay? So we, we get portal images, and y you know that image, but yesterday I made a mistake, and I, because I didn't use the PowerPoint presentation. I, I used PDF file. And I wanted to ask you, what's that? Yesterday you've seen the zebras, yes, but it's not easy to understand, yeah? Uh, so, well, just to show you how important are uh, contours. Sorry for that. That was my mistake, so. Okay, so eventually we, we get that information. We have the, uh, well, the vector which describes the error we made placing a patient, the setup error, okay? And of course, we may also have the, the angle of rotation. And again, for angle of rotation, if you see the angle of rotation error, you cannot do anything. There are some very special tables that can also rotate. But to be honest, I don't like it because try to put your patient on the table which is tilted then immediately patient is trying to, to come back to the previous position. So I think there is no other way to correct his or her position, <laughs> his position, just placing him again on the table. That's tedious, but anyway, you cannot do any, anything different from that. And now, correction strategies, and that's the 
very important part of my talk, how to correct. Because you collect the data, you make your portal images. You look at them and say it's good, it's bad, and so on. But you should use the data. If you don't use the data, it's just for nothing. You work so hard, and there is no advantage of your work. Okay. So what to do with the data? So let's remember that we try to explain our space in terms of systematic and random errors. Quantitatively, what does it mean systematic and random errors? Let's imagine, you, you make the portal control every day during the treatment, so there were 25 fractions, and you got uh, results. Each diamond describes your error. So the first day, at AP direction, your error was close to two millimeters. Uh, on fourth, you know, it's four, doesn't matter. Fourth fraction, your error was four millimeter, and so on. What is systematic error? Systematic error is just the mean value of all of all these mm, values. Okay, but you may ask me, well. Systematic error is known after completion of the treatment. That's right. And that's worthless, <laughs> because if we know what happened, it's nice to know that, but it would be much better to know what will happen. OK? OK, we come back to that problem. And the second one, standard deviation is just random error. So every day we, we have small difference between actual position and the mean position, and if we calculate the standard deviation, that describes the random error. Okay? Let's imagine that we have several patients. Patient number one, number two, number three. But what, what are these patients about whom I'm talking about? Well, sorry for my English. No, it doesn't matter. You understand me, I think. Well, it should be the homogeneous group of patients. What does it mean, homogeneous group of a patient? Treated in the same location, with the same technique, with the same immobilization devices, and not very thin, very thick, or I don't know, might be having some problems with spine or, well, different factors that can really influence on the position of, of, of him, OK? You should collect such a data in homogeneous groups. So we have three patients, you have three uh, systematic errors, and you have three uh, random errors, OK? Well, at one image, you have two directions, so we have information along two perpendicular axis so we can present that in in that form. So here you have the systematic error for the num for the pink patient for the for the red one. That's the vector describing the systematic error and so on. And of course the, the you may have many of, of such patients and now mathematics. First of all, if you have such a group of patients, homogeneous group of patients then let's say 20 patients. So you have 20 systematic errors for your patients. What would be the value of mean over the minus? Zero. Zero. Why? Because the, some of those data are canceling each other. Yes, but what is the reason they are canceling each other? Yes, but always we will have zero when we don't have zero. Because it may happen that it's not zero. Yeah. 
Okay, let's imagine what's right now the time on your watch. On my 10.28. Ah, it's the same. Oh, wow. We have a very good watch, so you know. But, okay, let's imagine you, that you receive all your watches from one shop. And in that shop, there is a mistake, there is an error. They thought that it's 10, but it's really, it's 9.45. Uh, okay, 945. So the average value is not 10. It's 9. It's close to 945. Because there is, in that system, there is systematic error. And it can be that there is a systematic error in your whole chain. For example, your laser system at one accelerator is different from the another accelerator. One accelerator really is well matched to the isocenter, but on the other accelerator is moved, let's say, three millimeters down. So if you treat the patient at the first accelerator, everything is right. But if you treat them on the second accelerator, because there is a difference between city simulator and, or between simulator and accelerator, your systematic error will be, would be three millimeters. So that's the most important information you get from your portal control. Collect the data for homogeneous group of patients. Calculate the mean error for each of these patients. And later on, calculate the mean over means. Okay, And that value should be very close to 0. You may use statistical tests to answer the question, it's, it's the reason to say that it's no zero or it is zero, OK? Again, that's, that's really very important. In our department, we have a problem with one location, which is the breast location. And we see the systematic, gross systematic error of about two to three millimeters. And we fight against that problem for several years. And this year, we probably found the reason for that. Professor Hartmann told you that the, well, now gating is used in radiotherapy. But gating is not the good solution for lung patients, because they, they have some problems with breathing. But it's not only the case if we think about lung patients, we noticed that when the patient is placed on the table, a lady, and it breathes very smoothly, when the table starts just to make CT examination, suddenly she changes her breathing. It's longer and less deeper. But that data are used for planning. But later on, when she's irradiated at the accelerator, the table doesn't move. So she breathes exactly in the same way. So it's very likely that when we take the SSD from that position, is different from the SSD we got from uh, from the treatment clinic system. Can you imagine? Two to three millimeters different we found in that way. But just because we compare our data, the mean data collected for portal control and for, uh, well, what we wanted to have, OK, our, our, our aim. So remember, that's there very important. Collect the data and analyze them. And very quickly, because I see that my time is coming to the end. Well, uh, uh, this is also important value. Why, I will tell you later on. Distribution of systematic errors. So it's com now it becomes more complicated. So you have homogeneous group. You have systematic errors for each individual patient. So it's the mean value, OK? Now you calculate the mean over means. 
that should be close to zero, and you calculate the standard deviation of these means. And that is the distribution of systematic errors. And that's important because that value you will use to calculate the margin. Okay? And random group error, which is just mean value of the standard deviations obtained for each single patient. Okay, let's look at that. This is the distribution of systematic error and distribution of, of uh, random random error, both of them are very close to, uh, no, sorry, mm. uh, this is distribution of systematic error, uh, sorry, there is a mistake in that graph, I've never noticed that, why it's a mistake, sorry for that. Because distribution of systematic error can be can be minus at plus, but yeah. but random error cannot be smaller than zero. The, the, well, something is wrong with that. Uh, sorry for that. It's it's taken from Ben Hyman, professor from Rotterdam. But uh, uh, sorry, I, I don't want to criticize him because he's very wise name and like him very much. It's his engineer medical physics is so, but might be the, the description is wrong. So, okay, strategies. We have online protocols and offline protocols. What is online protocols? Measure during, uh, measure and correct in the same fraction. So you take pictures, you compare them, and just correct the position of the patient. And it seems that the best way how to correct the position of your patient. Yes, but not, I don't fully agree with that. First of all, if you do that immediately from psychological point of view, you stop working at the high level. Because if you know that you can correct your error, well, your work become not very, a very good, made with a very good, very good quality. And, of course, it's a big effort to make everyday images to compare into irradiated patients. You make your treatment longer. It also deteriorates your treatment because as uh, the longer patient leaves on, uh, on the table, of course, there is a, a higher chance to, to, to misalignment between what you want and what you get. Okay? So I think that offline protocols are very good. And the, the protocol I'm, uh, I'm going to talk is no action level protocol, which is, in my opinion, the best protocol you can use. So online, uh, well, I just skipped that slide because it's, uh, that's the, the online correction. So you, you get image, you find the discrepancy. That's the question to organization of the department. Okay, and, uh, well, in, in my department. In my department, online correction is done by, by radiation technologies, and offline corrections are also made by radiation technologies because we have ingenious group of radiation technologies. However, they cooperate very strongly, let's say, with me. I'm responsible for, for all these procedures. So there is uh, the man I mentioned about is that man, and he is really responsible for that. And we prepare together all these protocols, and this group is responsible for that. And I can tell you that in just looking at images and to matching, they're much better than me. So they have big experience uh, with that. But that depends on the organization. Uh, certainly, uh, online corrections should be made by, by radiation technologies because it's difficult to, to have physicists all the time at accelerator and to have doctors all the time at the accelerator. And it's not needed, I think. It's not a very complicated task. If you train them w well, then, yeah, that's possible to, to do for, for them. 
I can imagine there is some politics behind that question, but anyway. <laughs> okay, so that's the online correction. Well, whatever images you use for that, you can, you can apply online correction. And no action level uh, protocol. So fraction first, second, and third. Set up a patient according to protocols. Make a portal control. And before fourth fraction, calculate the systematic error. Well, I, I should, uh, well, before I, I, I show you that slide, I should make another comment. I told you that we know the systematic error after completion of the treatment. And that's right. But if we assume that errors have normal distribution, okay, we may estimate very quickly, let's say, the mean error. What is the best estimate of the mean value if the dose distribution is normal? Is the mean over a several measurements. Okay, You do it every day. If you measure the dose rate, you output factor, you measure several times, and you rep represent your output factors with the main value of these four measurements. But of course, you may make them a lot, many of them. But you think that if you, if the, the, that's the normal distribution and it's not very wide, you may use, you may m m take only a few measurements to, to estimate the, the mean value. And that's exactly the same. So we take four portal, we, we make four po three portal controls, we calculate the mean value, and we say this is our estimate of the systematic error, okay? So before four fraction, we calculate the systematic error from four fraction on set up a patient according to protocol, it should be protocol, shift couch with the vector, uh, okay, it's minus all this value and irradiate. And that's very simple and very efficient protocol how to make your treatment very reproducible, okay? Just keep it. Uh... I waited for that question. <laughs> well, that's the original no action level protocol proposed by Rotterdam Group. What we do in our department, we have so called action levels. So if the difference between the actual position and the position we wanted to have is smaller than, let's say, for the head and neck two millimeters, we just leave a patient on the table. But if, if it's three millimeters, four millimeters, we shift the table during the first, second, and third fraction. But again, our protocol is more complicated. If the difference is larger than four millimeter, we stop the treatment. We try to find the reason for that, that we got such big in head and neck, of course. In pelvis, we have different. For example, for gyne gynecological treatment, these action levels are, if I remember well, it's, it's 4, 8, and 12 millimeters. So that makes the, the procedure more complicated, but it's, we follow that, that procedure. But original no action level protocol is as I, I, I told you, okay? So that's, that's very simple after third fraction, we calculate the mean value, which is estimate of the systematic error. And later on, when we got result, we move, we shift uh, the table of that value, okay? So the blue one is how the patient will be irradiated. And as you see, the, the final systematic error is very small one. Of course, there is always some residual error because that's 
that's clear from, from physics, from mathematics, that some residual error left, which is of that, uh, of that range. Sigma divided by number of, of uh, images, number of results you got to calculate the systematic error. Okay? So this is what you get without correction, without protocol, and what is you get with, with the protocol. So it's much, much better. And you may see it here. Residual after no action level protocol, uh, if it's applied, displacements for different locations. See that, for example, in prostate, the residual error is very close to one millimeter. I even cannot imagine that we can irradiate our patient with such a precision. The, the residual error is of the range of one, two millimeters. It's very precise treatment, okay? That I commented already, so I, I'm not going to talk about, to talk about that. So remember, the sums errors in dose de delivery are inevitable. So you cannot, you know, you, you, never life is perfect. So you will make some errors, and sometimes it happens. Uh, how to ensure that full prescribed dose will be delivered? By adding margins. Margins, you know, the margin between CTV and and. PTV, okay, clinical target volume and planning target target volume. How to calculate? Uh, we, we had two types of margins, setup margin, internal margin. Setup margin is just to compensate setup errors, and internal margin is to compensate movement of the target caused by physiology. That's much complicated problem. Yeah, yeah okay, I, I'm finishing. So you calculate the systematic error, random error, and we have two formulas to, to add margins. The first one is, is proposed by Malser van Herk, and the second one proposed by Strom. They are a little bit different. Wow, there is a mistake here. Sorry. It's, that is Marcel van Herk uh, formula, and that is Strom formula. Sorry for that. Wow. I don't know how it happened, but I, I recognize that. I, I changed it in my presentation, so. Okay. And now just, well, the last very important message to you. The data must be collected and regularly analyzed. It's never ending story. You should all the time collect the data of portal control and you should analyze that. And big errors must be analyzed as quickly as possible. A conclusion must be drawn. Don't leave it. And don't leave it to radiation technologies. You have to do that. You are able to analyze the data. OK, group systematic errors, I, I, I already talked about that. And thank you very much for your time.